YouTube and also send out the link to people on Facebook. Spam talk live now. Yep, it's definitely live. Yep. So let me, you want me, I'll just go ahead and send out the link now. Yeah, I am going to. Awesome. Great. Uh. Okay. Oh, I'll make it public. There we go. Ooh, Josh Adler's in the chat. Hi. Oh, yeah, and we, we still have four minutes to go. Yeah, we're ready. So yeah. Oh, and Bob. And Chase. Yay. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to like, I'm like looking up at my desktop monitor to see like what the latency is. He seems to be about 10 to 15 seconds. <laughs> yeah. All right. And there is my Facebook or my Facebook, my website. Facebook. Do I have Facebook open here? No. I do have Chrome open. Let's fix that. Oh, actually, hold on. I should not have done that. Oh, wait, I think it opened in Safari. Okay, good. Phew. Right there, I, I had a panic attack. I just closed Chrome, and then I thought to myself, wait a minute. What about all the YouTube links? <laughs> but that's in Safari, so we're good there. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I can send you again. That's not a problem. Oh, no, no, no. I I, I have them, and, but uh, it's... It's just so funny. I just wasn't even thinking. It's like, let's close Chrome to save memory. Wait a minute. <laughs> uh. 
ahead and move my phone over there so I don't get distracted. Okay, it's um should we wait uh, a bit or No, I think we can start. We, we can... got a lot to go over. <laughs> well great. Um let's do this. <laughs> let's well, do this. Thank you for um being here and talking to me and talking to the audience. Um and it was certainly a very exciting project for me to do this spam concert and the cave paintings of this course was obviously obviously the centerpiece of the of the concert and so it's really exciting um to talk about about the piece and about the composer so yeah um i actually never asked you about the title um in um in depth so maybe you can just talk about the title a little bit so people don't take it as take the um title of the piece as spam because it's certainly not the title of the piece yeah well first i want to thank you so much for having me here uh, i've been looking forward to this for quite some time and also to thank you for putting on this project i mean really it was one of the most fulfilling endeavors in my creative life and it was like super fun you know watching this whole thing come together and like this site specific concert that you were able to broadcast out to everyone who or anyone who was interested in watching and it was really really a special thing to be a part of so thank you um but yeah so the title cave paintings of discourse has an unusual uh, uh origin well, for one thing, it is programmatic to the piece. Um, I, it just hap so happened to fit. But the uh, the title was originally thought of during a dinner I had. I, I had I was eating dinner with um, our direct our director of the choir, uh, Natalie Malice, and her husband. And somehow in the conversation, we were just uh, really just just we're just discussing like the, the state, and this was back in June, and we're discussing kind of the state of, of society. And, 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 and we had just determined that, you know, nobody was listening to each other. Certainly nobody's listening to, you know, the experts in the field and, and people are talking, it, it seemed like people were talking at each other and not to each other. And this, um, this failure in communication, uh, I had likened to, well, it's as if like people are just like, putting cave pa like paintings up on a cave wall and and that's like the level of discourse that we're uh, experiencing in society and then um and then it just struck me like cave paintings of discourse and uh Natalie's like that sounds like a really great name for a, t a title of a piece I'm like you betcha and then it just so happened that you had invited me to become a part of this endeavor not long afterwards i'm like this is like how can i pass up this opportunity so yeah the cave paintings of discourse is ultimately uh you know and we'll talk about like the piece itself in a, in a, in a second but it does have to do with um my expression of, of frustration about how how we're handling not only the pandemic but just you know politics interpersonal relationships and it's just just the increasing um stress and and uh and like really ill will amongst um humankind thank you um i when i started playing new music and uh, actually quite many pianists and musicians told me because they they knew me and they knew my playing when I mostly played standard repertoire, they said, um, oh, I wish you, you, you know, now you play new stuff all the time. I wish you play beautiful music again, or I wish you play normal music again. And that really hurt me um, a lot when I heard that. And also it was very upsetting to hear that um, and made me really think what's, beautiful when you when you say beautiful beautiful music what is what is really beautiful and 
what it's the sound that we um, we <laughs> accept or majority of uh, people and even musicians um, accept and it really um, opened my eyes uh, this this particular piece opened my eyes and I, I really hoped um, that I also could open others eyes uh, and ears and be really open to the definition of beauty and definition of music. Yeah, um, actually your point about uh, what is beauty in music is really well put. And it's something that I think a lot of composers struggle with. Um, for one thing, and, and uh, back at the University of Illinois, uh, where I got my doctorate, it just so happened that this very topic was brought up in one of our seminars. And, you know, the, the question, well, it, it had to do, we had a guest composer, it may have been uh, Marcos Balter at the time, I, I can't remember precisely who, but somebody had, uh, meant, had identified something in, in his piece as particularly beautiful. And then uh, one of our, because we sometimes get people from the community actually coming in and joining our seminars. And, and they're all like these hippies that were uh, disciples of Herbert Brune. And, and, and so had been around the, the composition scene for decades. And one of them had just had really balked at that and, and just asked out loud, like, what do you mean beautiful? What's beautiful? Like, you know, it's like, I, I think a, a well-crafted algorithm is beautiful. It does it, even if it, you know, you might not think it sounds that way. And, and, you know, it really, you know, of course, for most people, beautiful um, equates to something that's ultimately, you know, sonically pleasing. I would even hesitate to say consonants because, Plenty of times dissonances can be absolutely beautiful, even to, um, you know, the, the average person's ear. And um, and so, you know, I, I, for me, I, I tend to approach my own pieces in, in more of like tension and release and using, um, you know, or combinations of pitches like or uh, certain uh, comb like and, and not only like the fundamental pitches, but then like also exciting in like emphasizing certain overtones um, as, a, as, a, as a tool to deal with this tension and release. And um, but so I, I guess my my question to you is, do you think my piece is beautiful? <laughs> I actually don't. I don't know. I wasn't sure what you were applying with that. <laughs> no, I, absolutely. I to me, of course, it was beautiful and it was beautiful experience and there mm. there are um you know, a lot of things that uh you experience as a performer and what i guess what i look for these days is not just beautiful because um the idea of the whole concert was um actually that i'm not going to give you beautiful um, but I'm going to give you something that you can think about or, mm. or you can be puzzled about. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's a bit outdated. I mean, that's how I feel like I, I still, although I still say when things are beautiful, I say beautiful and I believe I, I, I play beautiful music, a lot of beautiful music um, and all these pieces that I perform um, at the concert, I believe they're all beautiful to me. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And it's um, also, you know, people talk about John Cage, what is, what is the sound of music and what is the um, function of music or what can we call music? They talk about John Cage or I listened to um, Guero by Rakanman with my students <laughs> and confused them a lot that they, um, you know, that you kind of wonder that whether you should consider it as, consider this as music. Um, some might question because certainly it's very different from conventional music that they're always listening to or always performing. So, yeah, to me, it's beautiful. <laughs> well, 
I'm glad. And, and to me too. And, and I, I echo your sentiment that the whole concert was beautiful. Um, I was actually kind of hoping that people would feel uncomfortable when listening to my piece. I mean, that was kind of the idea of including the tea kettle <laughs> and then the cooking spam. I mean, I was feeling uncomfortable even during like the, the rehearsals and, and the concerts. It's just like my, my instinct is let's go turn those things off. And, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, but, but therein I feel lies the beauty. I think each one of the pieces in the concert really had us had um, certainly myself, but I, I, I feel confident in speaking for many in the audience, like really like re, considering like like really thinking about their perspective on on certain things i think it was pretty clear you know the subject matter like the impetus behind the concert and i hope that um that people took away from it like this this just like you had said like this uh like maybe new perspectives or, or new ways of looking at things or, or really just at the very least just maybe having some sort of a cathartic experience because we're all going through um really uncomfortable times yeah absolutely i mean i actually felt anxious about going to the kitchen and turning things off because i was hearing this boiling and sizzling and all that so i always have had that um but um yeah i mean that that was also interesting experience for a performer because you you go through all these um, negative feelings, actually. Um, and then you, you're also giving that out, um, which you cannot do in the um, traditional concert setting. Um, there, obviously, there, there are a few things that I, I thought about um, uh, when I was performing the piece. But I mean, we can get into that later also. So I actually wanted to start with, uh, um, since we we're talking about this, about what is music and what is the sound and what's beauty, um, that I actually would like to share um, uh, the uh, John Cage's Water Walk. <laughs> with yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So let me share my screen. Um... And here's, ho here's hoping, of course, Zoom's controls are in the way. Um, wait, where is, did I not? Oh, here it is. Okay. So I was searching for the link and then I got the link. Okay. Yeah, it was back when I was like afraid that I had lost all my, all the links. I was just like, oh, let's open up Water Walk again. Um, okay. So here's hoping. water walk it? because it contains water and because I walk during its performance. That figures, doesn't it? Uh, now, also, two things I want you to notice. Over here, Mr. Cage has a tape recording machine, which will provide much of the... Will you touch the machine so we can know where it is? Which will provide much of the background. Uh, also, he works with a stopwatch. The reason that he does this is because these sounds are in no sense accidental uh, in, their, uh, in their sequence. They each must fall mathematically at a precise point. So he watches his watch as he works. He takes it seriously. I think it's interesting. If you are amused, you may laugh. Uh, if you like it, you may buy the recordings. John Cage and Walter Walk.
It's amazing. <laughs> it is an amazing piece. Yeah. There's, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we talked about it a little bit um, before, but um, there's a little parallel to the cape paintings of this course. <laughs> There is. I mean, I actually was not thinking of water walk, water walk specifically as I was composing it, but uh, for sure, um, you know, I, I knew from the get go that, you know, my piece is going to have some Cajun elements because, you know, he's a very influential composer on just, you know, of course, music and also just uh, studying Cage has really like changed how I looked at music. So um, if, this, if anything, this it would be considered kind of an homage. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, well, I, I saw so you have this um, way to um, make uh, typical sound, you know, typical sound of piano or typical sound of um, harp, for example, um, and turn that into something um, unexpected, um, something unusual or different. Um, and that's how I felt when I listened to the Dreamscape. Number one, um, that <laughs> everybody associate the uh, harp with something pretty and beautiful. Um, but it, it, I think the piece has that different, uh, quite different, quite different atmosphere and quite different effect. So. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so Dreamscape number one, and by the way, I want to give a, a shout out to uh, Park Juwon uh, or Juwon Park, who is in the, the chat as he is, uh, you know, has taught at this particular institute, but uh, Dreamscape number one was the commission I had for the very first time I went to the Splice Institute over the summer. And uh, it was my the very first piece I had written for instrument electronics. Up until that point, my, out, my electroacoustic output was completely uh, acousmatic uh, in t and almost always, in fact, always fixed media. Um, so this was definitely it was definitely a challenge uh, thinking of a way to to really bridge the sound world of the harp together with uh, my electroacoustic um, uh, vocabulary. And while I certainly would go about it very differently if I had written it today, um, still, it, it was uh, an interesting initial attempt at a at a piece for instrument electronics. And it's it still remains a, a rather one a, a part of my portfolio that's still kind of near and dear to me um uh certainly uh i i wasn't as successful with dreamscape number two and i don't public i don't like post that anywhere for good for good reason but yeah uh um but thank you like i um it's it i this is the first time i've talked about dreamscape number one in years even <laughs> Yeah, no, I thought that's a beautiful piece. And um, yeah, maybe we can listen to it. Sure. Uh, I'll go back to here. Oh, I think I'm, yeah, I'm sharing audio.
Yeah, I figure it's probably appropriate just to share at least the first half of it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, and I should I should mention the very talented harpist who uh, performed that work is none other than Jennifer Ellis. So uh, she is a champion of new, new music and is uh, quite an active harpist, um, just really just on the mu new music scene in general. So, uh, yeah, so thanks to her. She, she really brought it to life. And I learned a lot about the harp working with her. Um, incidentally, uh, one of the uh, implements I used or I asked her to use is she assured me this would be great. In fact, she... Um, had loaned me a uh, or uh, several. Well, she, well, she was in California, so she didn't actually loan me, but but she had pointed me in the direction of several harp um, uh, or books on the contemporary harp, and one of them had mentioned the use of a fan uh, against the strings. And so I asked her, "Is like, is this going to be okay? Would you balk at it?" And she's like, "No, absolutely not." In fact, she had like. Um, she was able to find a portable uh, fan that you'd normally use to like cool, cool yourself for the summer and just like ran that across the strings. And you might have heard that around like the two and a half, three minute mark uh, as I, I had her perform ah. the, the main uh, uh, one of the major uh, uh, th these, like thematic uh, cells using the uh, using a fan. So kind of gives it an underwatery shimmery effect. Wow, that's cool. Well, I remember that you asked me that if I, um, I don't know if I remember correctly, but it was um, one of the composers asked me if I would uh, prepare the piano. Ended up nobody was using. Well, actually, I asked you that actually, and yeah, I. Uh, well, you uh, um, for the Sosenu to Peder. Yeah, I, I felt like that was enough. Um, my original sketches had the use of some preparation or at least had mentioned it but I'm but the more I thought about it, the more I thought it I, I really I wanted the kind of like the resonance of these of like this your wonderfully tuned piano strings to really just like fill the the, the space and, and I thought adding preparations would only like dilute or perhaps even like really corrupt that sound and, and while I could have I guess uh, accommodated that and, and made use of it in certain ways. I felt like the the tea kettle and the like was was more than enough corruption, so um, I, I decided against it. Yeah, well, I mean, I usually do this um, at the end of the talk, but I think this is actually proper proper to uh, play the piece right now, and then we talk about it. Uh, okay. So if you can share the I sure will the premiere of <laughs> this is actually a dress rehearsal. Um but
Yay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and I definitely need to applaud you because, like, oh man, it's uh, nothing is more gratifying than a than like a, a performer bringing one's own composition to life. It's just it's it's absolutely a thrill just rewatching it. <laughs> It was, uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, it was, uh, of course, the experience I never had before um, with, uh, of course, dealing with so many non-musical things um, that I usually I don't get to do that in the, especially on the stage, you can't imagine um, cooking spam or boiling water on stage. So um, that was something obviously different. Um, and also this kind of uh, discontinuity that you have, you, you're consistently interrupted by something else um, and have to do um, other than playing piece. Um, I mean, that whole thing is, of course, a part of peace, but um, that for me that I have this always kind of this main job that I'm just playing on the keys. Um, uh, but then I have this moments of stop um, very often. Um, and that was actually very refreshing to me that um, I never thought of this before that um, I also always thought that, well, I, I go on a stage and I bow and I sit down and start playing and, and that's it. I don't stop um, until I bow um, at the end. Um, and that's what people expect, uh, expect me to do. And that's what they expect. They want to hear this continuous sound uh, or something happening. But um, here, uh, it's just it really looks like I just can't concentrate. I can't just it's you know, I have to worry about so many things when I and that's what exactly happens when I <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was a little bit like a autobiography for me learning piece in a way <laughs> that I'm doing exactly what I actually do uh, when I practice at home. Um, but um, yeah, definitely there was that, that um, um, discontinuity. And I thought that, that was actually really beautiful quality of the piece and uh, um, beautiful quality of the music that it discontinues. And that's, that was so special to me that it, it doesn't continue. Wow. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's... Uh... I, I'm, I'm quite touched to hear that. Um, and it's, it's really like, uh, again, the impetus behind the piece was really to convey the sense of, you know, constant, like, like discomfort, uh, this discontinuity of discourse. And, you know, of course, being trapped in one's own environment as we are, although I, you know, really this idea of, of, of of the lockdown isn't, I mean, it's in there, but it, it's not really what the, the piece is, is about. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, for me, it's just what I really appreciated about this project and the opportunity that I had was um, to use really you like not just the piano, but, but your, your home, 
you know like it was one of the things that really uh inspired me was when you had started this project and had told us composers really go wild here's everything in my house is at your disposal and that really like that was extremely liberating for me and was able and because of that i was able to like really um find ways like to really make use of of your house and and these everyday items to convey the just the the disharmony that we have in everyday life and and um and and yeah like it, it was it was definitely uh you know it, it was it was an absolutely fulfilling and exciting experiment to take uh to take part of and i i hope i get the opportunity to do it again um but yeah i mean really like like not approaching this as a piece for the stage but you know to really make it a piece for um piano and me kitchen appliances and utensils and spam <laughs> Well, I, well, I can probably share the score. Um, oh, I, I have it pulled up too. Yeah. Um, hmm? Or, but I mean, if you have it pulled up, that's that's fine. I, <laughs> it's okay. Either way is fine. I and I, I was wondering uh, hmm. that. I mean, I, I think in terms of sound, of course, that you want to have that, want that stand because of that sizzle, sizzling sound. Hmm. Um, but were there any um, other reasons that it, it's not bacon? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I mean, bacon would have been even better for that sizzling. Although the smell of burning bacon, I, I don't think would have been uh, quite as uh, easy to tolerate. But uh, but no, I mean, really, it, I'm afraid of divulging too much because I, I really want everybody to take away from this piece, you know, what it is that they take away from it and i don't want to lead the witness too much but but really spam does relate to like it does relate to internet spam you know like uh or it, and also for both as a noun and as a verb like people spamming uh one's you know facebook feed or email or just you know just just it's these are stupid, pointless, annoying messages, <laughs> and uh, and they're not productive. They, they don't help, and um, really, like that's that 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 was the motivation behind using spam specifically. Yeah. Um, also, I mean, I really like that kettle sound, um, and I, it actually it always made me pretty nervous. <laughs> that's why I chose it, and then. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to run in and just, um, you know, shut off so that it stopped boiling or I felt like, oh, I'm going to burn the kettle. Or I'm <laughs> something. Yeah, and that kettle was great. I mean, I had, if you recall, I had tried, uh, because the, the kettle I, I used was um, uh, the very same tea kettle that my mother uses for her tea. And it's old um well not ancient but it, you know it, it's not new and uh it just makes like this most hideous squealing when you know the water is boiling and i didn't want to of course deprive her of her tea kettle and so uh but you know i i i didn't have one of my own so um uh, thankfully my i was able to grab uh, uh my, my mother had sent me with a uh, um it was a, a tea kettle we had gotten for hurricanes um, just in case like the power were to go out and we would, could use our propane uh, uh, grill and heat up water that way. And since it's, it's not the same tea kettle she typically uses, um, we don't have to worry about like, well, so if it burns it, it burns it. Um, but it was just, it was so quiet. It was just not at all to the amplitude required for this piece. And uh, so, so finally I, I, I had uh, sheepishly asked her if I could bring the kettle that we heard in the recording, and she was as su super happy to oblige. Um, but yeah, it's that that kettle was like it's just like perfect for this piece. I, I just knew I, I had to use it. <laughs> yeah, thank you for thank you to her <laughs> for. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the instrument, <laughs> <laughs> but it really because I had to also shout 
um, mm -hmm. and that was out of um, despair or frustration. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought that also goes with this, with this kind of squeal and scream of the tea kettle. Um, and uh, yeah, it just um, also one another thing about the piece that um, it's uh, still, you know, it's it's a vulnerable experience for someone to, especially pianist, um, to uh, use own voice uh, during the piece uh, or shout or um, hum. Um, so I always thought the music kind of should really help that action. Um, because I'm not, I'm not an actor or I'm, yeah, I'm not a singer. Um, and I found that actually your, you know, the, um, the material that you use for me to play on piano. Um, I mean, that what we are seeing right now, uh, something like that, those figure or dynamic that really makes me very comfortable to do things. So I thought it just worked really so well. And you know, even something like uh, this, the uh, you can probably see that um, double dot, double dotted rhythm, and that this accent um, uh, and this articulation, and you can just after that you can just rise immediately, um, and it's all the small details, but it makes things work for, for me. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, I, it, that's, you know, it's one of those things, like I remember back to uh, the spam talk with Emily Coe, mm -hmm. uh, who was here in the chat. So <laughs> hi again, Emily. Uh, but uh, of course, my uh, reasoning behind this is not anywhere near hers, but even though I am a, well, piano is my primary instrument. Let's just say that. I wouldn't consider myself a pianist. Um, I still am always uncomfortable writing for the piano. And honestly, I don't typically like it. I, I avoided it as much as I could for years. I started writing for piano again when I was getting my doctorate because I, I started to feel like maybe I want to perform my own music. And I did uh, perform one of my pieces. Um, but then I just, it's just not for me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, I'm always self-conscious about my piano writing because I'm, I'm afraid like, well, since piano is my primary instrument, if I write, if I don't write for it, well, like, how's that going to like reflect on me? At least if I write for an instrument I'm not familiar with, um, you know, it's like, I, I could be, you know, sheepish and yeah, maybe I should have done more research, but at least it's understandable <laughs> if I make a mistake somehow. But, um, but you know, it, it, it definitely, it was a great relief to me uh, during our first rehearsal when you had mentioned that the piano part was so comfortable to play. I was like, oh, thank God. Cause I was uh, not, sh <laughs> I, uh, even though I would go through the entire piano part myself much slower than that tempo, but really like test to make sure, okay, like how would I even finger this? And I think this is doable, but I still, you know, cause I never played at that tempo. I'm like, maybe it's just, I mean, you're a fantastic pianist uh, for sure, but you know, maybe I am asking too much. I don't know. And so it's uh, it was a relief for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you didn't. I don't think you asked too much. I mean, everything mm -hmm. was very reasonable. Um, and I, th I think what I really liked was, um, I, I talked about this with uh, Tyler as well, but there, there are certain things that it's not about, oh, it lies, you know, lies well uh, on the key and it's it fits well on fingers. It's, um, it's not just about that, but it's about how you can reach the climax. Um, and you should, I feel like I, as a performer, I, I should feel very comfortable uh, reaching the climax actually in the in the piece. Um, so musically, it has to be convincing to me to, um, you know, like also this involved uh, some motion, this frustration and collapsing on the keys. Um, so um, in that regards, I think it, it 
I just really, really enjoyed because it was very convincing that way. And there, all, all, there are all these gestures and articulation that's, um, that just uh, feels very comfortable and enjoyable. Um, and, you know, also there this, uh, I think I start noticing that this from your music, but there is this contrast and it happens really quick. Uh, and I, I thought also that also works really well. Um, and because it could be that you were a pianist, that you know how to change things. So this contrast works when somebody plays. So, I mean, that's, that's things, those are things that I really enjoyed. Well, thank you. Uh, that means a lot to hear, for sure. And uh, and yeah, it's uh, you know, I'm glad that you put it that way too, because it's interesting. Um, recently, I was on a well, you were there <laughs> uh, a Zoom conference, a public Zoom conference uh, call with some assembly required, as I have a a piece that is soon to be released on their debut album, and uh, one of the comments that uh, that I believe it was uh, Justin Stanley, the horn player made, was that he, he, after listening to a number of my pieces and that one too, that he, he feels like my 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 piece tends my pieces tend to be kind of uh, very noticeably partitioned, and it's that's also something that I'm self conscious about because on the one hand I I actually do consciously strive for the, the very kind of contrast that you that you you're saying and and uh, and part of that especially came about after I started getting into electroacoustic music, because really like um, I, I always want to keep like 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 uh, very little is more, um, well, I shouldn't put it that way. I'm not a big fan of static electroacoustic pieces. I, I'm just not. And, and I really think one of the uh, the benefits and one of the, the really, uh, the appeals to the medium is that you could be like super kinetic and, and just have have gestures and 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 musical material just go all over the place and you have spatialization also that can be used as an expressive and um, uh, and structural tool and I think some of that kind of has bled into my acoustic writing and so I I, I tend to like um, to to really shift gears and, and try to to maximize uh, the, you know the the just the contrast in in my musical material uh, to keep it always in motion. Yeah, it's. I mean, it certainly adds to the drama, and um, yeah, it helped me to play the piece. So yeah, it's really fun that way. Well, great. Yeah, um, I see if anybody has any questions i haven't seen any in the chat um anyone uh, um any questions now is your chance i mean there, of course there is a 15 second latency so yeah yeah but the funny thing is is that the longer we wait the longer it just compounds <laughs> so <laughs> um true. Well, I guess not. Maybe all their questions have been answered. So, yeah. but that that is fine. I certainly had fun being here tonight. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Me too. Um, yeah. Is there? Um, I mean, I I would like to hear the um, um, little bit of verbal. Which... Oh, okay. So, uh, okay, we do have. I see a thank you in the chat. I guess it's a little premature. Um, I, I thought we were wrapping things up, <laughs> but yeah, there, there, but I was hoping, in fact, I've, I've, I've queued up an excerpt of, of Virgo. So, um, cause I would feel remiss in not, um, at least playing a little bit of it. Um, so, uh, Virgo 3C273 is a piece for cello and live electronics. Um, and so, you know, ever since I started, uh, well, the organ where I co-founded the organization Null State with my uh, associate Melody Chua, and um, and really started getting into uh, computer programming for for music and and, and like because that my initially and I don't have time to really go into this tangent, but just as a in a nutshell, my original 
life trajectory was computer science. It wasn't music. And, um, and so the discovering of, uh, this, this, you know, the, the ability to, uh, to really like, like alter to process an instrument signal live, just that, that, that's where I, that's how I finally like really found my place. You know, I had been writing acousmatic music for so long and even dreamscape was for harp and fixed media, but, but now to act, to be able to, to harness like the power of the computer, like write my own code and, and have the computer really transform the sound of the instrument in ways that I, I really want is just absolutely intoxicating for me. And so that's kind of been my uh, focus for the past several years. Um, but this piece is, uh, it was commissioned by a cellist who's uh, part of the Bomberg Philharmonic Academy, uh, Carol Tsai, uh, for her um, master's recital. She was she had just finished master's study at the Zurich University of the Arts in Zurich, Zurich Switzerland. And uh, it's, it's way too long to play the whole thing. It's about 17 minutes, but uh, I'm going to place a few excerpts uh, that showcase this idea of having um, the cello like react, the cellist react to the electronics and the, in, in turn, the electronics, which are all generated, uh, at least in this, in these particular excerpts from the cello itself. Um, how the cello um, or how the electronics react to the cello. So without further ado, here is my final excerpt uh, or piece of, of the night.
Okay, so that was some parts of Virgo 3C 273 out of context. <laughs> an absolutely beautiful piece. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I think we can uh, wrap it up. And thank you again. And yeah. Well, yeah, and thank you. Uh, again, I, I, I can't, uh, I, I know I, I, I've stated it several times, but I can't overstate just how important this project was. And, um, and these talks are just, are just like icing on the cake um, <laughs> and it's just it's 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 a thrill to be able to share my my craft with with you and with and with uh our audience and um uh yeah i it just it's uh it's this is a, a wonderful experience and thank you so much for for having me sure yeah yeah more soon so yeah <laughs> more. absolutely so Okay, I think. And we'll thanks, everyone. <laughs> I'm looking at the chat. <laughs> Thank you, and good night, everybody.